what? I'm going to go to bat for Star Wars Outlaws in this review because I think it got treated too harshly. It's a good and fun game. It doesn't redefine open world games or stealth games or third person shooters, but it doesn't have to, nor did I ever get the impression that it was trying to. Instead, it relies on strong world building, a surprising emphasis on choice and consequence, fun but simple stealth and combat, and a dash of Star Wars charm to get the job done. And quite frankly, I'm stunned to be sitting here starting this review off like this after being discouraged in part by pre-release impressions and post-release bashing online. But I think this is a case where a perfectly good and enjoyable game is being held to some really high standard, lambasted for not reinventing the wheel, and to me, it's sort of unjustified. I can see the faults like anyone else, questionable AI, an eye-rolling season pass, a lack of narrative punch, and some short of stellar character designs, and even some other things. But to write this game off as a complete failure, as a broken mess, as a disgrace to Star Wars, or the worst game of the year, is done in bad faith. Every year, it seems like a few games are held to an incredibly high threshold, belittled because they rely on accepted and pre-established genre standards instead of resetting the industry's expectations of what gaming should be, and for no real reason. This reaction sometimes, but not always, stems from factors outside of the merits of the game itself, and I think that's unfortunate. A pre-release negative disposition paired up with confirmation bias leads a perfectly fine game to the graveyard as it undersells. Star Wars Outlaws seems to be the latest victim of this, and to be honest, it hasn't been battered and bruised as much as some other less fortunate games. But during the initial release window, I saw lots of cherry picking online, where Outlaws was dismissed outright for small reasons. Like, speeder combat seemed a little weak, or punching a stormtrooper knocks them out despite them having armor, or arenas including explosive red barrels. A series of small details that didn't really paint the full picture, or taking shots at the game over including some genre norms. Meanwhile, the Twitter algorithm went nuts over tweets claiming that this game relies heavily on forced stealth with unforgiving checkpoints, and I almost never found that to be the case. Even before the patch, and especially after. I can see how hearing this would get people to cancel pre-orders or to not buy the game at all, because yes, that sucks. Unforgiving checkpoints and forced stealth is often bad, but I didn't find it to be that bad pre-patch, and like I said, it was even better afterwards. The stealth, meanwhile, got hammered for being mechanically light, yet I found the pet companion to add a lot to the experience. Combined with good level design and chaotic and flashy combat, it ended up being perfectly serviceable and fun even. Anyway, yeah, I had to get all that off my chest because being exposed to all those negative opinions almost dissuaded me from buying this game. And I liked it. And so I'm glad I held the faith. I'm not saying you have to, but I want to give this game a fair shake. So now let's get into the review proper. Star Wars Outlaws, a good game with some flaws. Let's go. One thing that Outlaws did market itself as being was an open world game, the first of its kind for the Star Wars license. Designing an open world and filling it are two separate things, but I must admit they cooked when it comes to the former. There's five explorable planets in Star Wars Outlaws, although only three of them can be considered open world. Tatooine, Akiva, and Toshara. Kajimi and the tutorial planet Kantonika are both single cities, but that doesn't mean they are devoid of content. More on that in a bit. Star Wars planets are perhaps best characterized by one thing, a full commitment to a single biome. The volcanoes of Mustafar, the oceans of Kamino, and the cityscapes of Coruscant all come to mind. Massive games needed to get this one characteristic right when it came to planning out the environments of their planets. And they succeeded. Tatooine must have been the simplest given how iconic it is. 
The team took that memorable desert planet and translated it wonderfully into an explorable open world. Flat stretches of nothing, hilly sand dunes to leap from, and a few arid mountains to make the world register on a topography map, at least a little. Those multiple suns loom high up in the sky, and the famous Tatooine huts remain ever present. How it looks like Luke Skywalker could come out of these at any moment. They nailed Tatooine. Now, from my understanding, Akiva, Kajimi, and Kantonika were all planets found in the Star Wars universe before Outlaws, but this really seems to be the first time we've seen them in full. Akiva's biome is jungle, lush leaves, thick branches, tons of water, and greenery for as far as the eye can see. It contrasts with Tatooine so well, it's a landscape with heaps upon heaps of verticality. On Tatooine, it's point and go. On Akiva, you're gonna need a compass and map. It's a challenge in navigation, giving the planet a bit of personality, pushing back against your desire to explore. This contrast in looks and layout leads to a totally different experience for navigating these different open worlds. With gameplay scenarios being repeated from planet to planet, it's nice that the world design can shoulder some of the responsibility of making these planets feel unique. And then there's Toshara, a planet born anew to the Star Wars mythos. It's defined by grassy plains and rolling hills, aiming for a mix between Tatooine's flatness and Akiva's mountains. You won't find massive walls of rock and stone, but instead a series of relatively easy to traverse slopes as you work your way towards them on grassy flatlands. It's the first major planet you'll explore, and it sets a great tone for what you can expect when visiting later planets. They did a great job of capturing the spirit of these biomes, and they lead to some beautiful and diverse worlds to explore, geographically consistent as individuals, but diverse as a bunch. Ah, but there's also the city lights, and boy do they beckon you in. Kantonika and Kajimi are only experienced as city streets, but they do impress as well. Kajimi is a world defined by harsh winds, icy snowdrifts, and lots of warm clothing. And Kantonika, well, it's a bit forgettable to be fair, but it's mostly used for the tutorial and not much more. But overall, when it came to creating planets that feel at home in the Star Wars universe, the team succeeded in droves. Another large reason for that success is the game's liberal use of Star Wars iconography, sprinkled in throughout these worlds to make them immediately identifiable as belonging to George Lucas's original vision. The game takes place between Empire Strikes Back and Return of the Jedi when the Imperials are at their full power. Stormtroopers can be found in almost every major city area, pestering locals and keeping tabs. No matter where you go, their presence is felt, like a looming fist just waiting to squash you out of existence. But it's more than the white armored soldiers, it's a museum of Star Wars illustrative models to feast your eyes upon. The iconic houses of Tatooine, the recognizable humanoid species, the various types of speeders, its droids, the wardrobes dominated by ponchos, the laser blasting guns, and so much more. It all screams Star Wars, perhaps even more than Star Wars Jedi Survivor last year. It's awfully impressive, as even the most jaded towards Disney's Star Wars antics will still crack a smile at a few things, some of which are amazing cameos by legendary series characters. No spoilers yet, but these were mostly cool moments. The team did an immaculate job of making their worlds feel like a part of the greater Star Wars universe, and it shines through regardless of what planet you're on. And sometimes, you don't even have to be on a planet to appreciate things. When leaving the surface and traveling upwards, you'll encounter a handful of traversable areas in space. These all felt relatively samey, save for the space above Kajimi, which has a thick cloud of gas dividing up its different sub-areas. You won't find much up here outside of asteroids and some broken ships, but there are a handful of bases to check out, although they remain quite basic. The best thing in space is usually something that can also be found on the planets, Imperial Compounds. Man, nothing in this game feels quite as Star Wars as exploring these hangar bays and the surrounding areas. 
The warmth of nature you feel on the planets is scrubbed away, replaced with layer upon layer of thick machinery, heavy metals, plastic stormtroopers, and an unnerving lack of windows. They nailed the design of these Imperial spaces, and I would be remiss to not mention them, even though they aren't part of the open world design. Alright, quick pause here. This is Editor NopeNapNarp, coming to you from the future to explain the title of this video with a disheartening message. This is where the heavily edited and handcrafted portion of the video must unfortunately end. It was around this point in the editing process that my external hard drive, containing all my captured footage for Star Wars Outlaws, got bumped off my desk and broke. Lovely. A perfectly good two terabyte hard drive lost to sheer accident. As a result, I lost all my footage not only for this game, but for many others I've already played this year. But I think it should only impact this review, fortunately. As for this video, I didn't want my time spent writing and recording to go to waste, so I decided to finish it up in a bit of a broken state. I went back to the game and recorded some footage of me just messing around to play in the background for the remainder of this video. So it's not really going to pertain to the words coming out of my mouth or be heavily edited, and so any claims I make, well, you're just gonna have to decide if you trust me or not. I apologize for the inconvenience, but I don't have the time to replay this game from the start to get the new footage with so many other projects to move on to. I really hate to put out a video like this, one that feels so unfinished and unpolished, but it's one of those cases where I feel like I don't have another choice. So I'm sorry for that. I hope you can understand, and if you want to listen to the rest of this video while doing something else, I really don't blame you. Again, I apologize, and things should be back to normal for the next video. And with that, let's get back to Star Wars Outlaws. Venturing back planet side though, and each is home to a series of cities and crime syndicates. The cities of Mira, Mos Eisley, Bestine, Miragana, and more are all a treat to explore in their own ways while capturing both the spirit of their planets and of the Star Wars universe. While the open world has plenty of content on its own, the city streets are densely packed with it too, whether it be finding crafting materials, mini treasure depots, cantinas with job offers, food stands, places to rest, and conversations to listen upon. In some ways, these are even more fun to explore than the open world because of their density and the sense of player-driven exploration. You never know who or what is around each corner. And that brings us to the four major crime syndicates that you'll be interacting with on a consistent basis across each planet. The Huts, the Pikes, Crimson Dawn, and the Ashiga. Each of these four crime families are vying for resources and power on each planet, while doing their best to avoid clashing directly with the Empire. It's a power struggle through and through. They work mostly in the shadows and are always looking for crafty and witty outlaws to help them with their business. And that's where our character, Kay Vess, comes into the picture. Culturally, these four factions all have a bit of diversity, but for the most part, they all function the same. Narratively, they don't contribute too much to the overall story, although, again, you will come face to face with them often. So, surprisingly, it's the gameplay that is most affected by their inclusion, along with the reputation system that accompanies it. Throughout the open worlds and the city areas, each faction lays claim to turf. This includes large meaty portions of the planet sides you'll speed through, as well as walled off portions of the city streets, both of which are packed with guards on duty. Your relationship with each faction is what determines how they will treat you upon entering their territory. You can do a handful of activities like contracts and side quests for each faction and will often be asked to make choices that raise your affinity with one while lowering it with another. These choices carry consequence as pissing off one faction will lead to drastically different treatment on their turf versus one that you've gotten in good with. In short, if they hate you, they blast you, they send killing squads after you, and they pay you very poorly. If they like you, they will let you in and work with their merchants and other NPCs. 
And if they really love you, they will let you take some of their supplies for free, give you access to exclusive items that do affect gameplay in minor ways, and even allow you to enter the most guarded areas. I really like this system as it gave some of the choices in quest lines a tangible consequence for Kay while altering the mood of the world. There were times when I needed to talk to an NPC or secure an item and I was able to just waltz right in because I was in good with that faction, while other times I had to sneak in and avoid detection. When people talk about the mandatory stealth sections, this is what they were referring to, at least from what I can gather. Getting caught gets you kicked out and you have to try again from the beginning. A bit frustrating, but easy to alleviate with careful maneuvering or by raising your affinity with a faction. And there are a surprising amount of things that can affect your reputation. Choices you make, completing side quests and contracts, killing guards, getting caught stealing, trespassing on private territory, and more. Most of the time, whether it's choices you make in quest lines or player mistakes in gameplay, it feels like the consequences are on your shoulders, never unpredictable or unfair, but instead a result of poor planning or execution from you the player. Except for when you're on a speeder. I had a lot of times where I accidentally drove through the protected turf and lost reputation for trespassing, and that seemed a little unfair. It didn't really feel like my fault. I guess it was, but it didn't feel like the game did a great job of preparing me for that. Now, I can't praise this reputation system blindly though, as it is quite easy to be in at least good standings with three of the four factions at any given time, as was the case for me, and I did that without much effort. If I took the time to complete a few extra contracts, I could have easily been in fine with every single faction. Perhaps not maxed, but enough that they wouldn't shoot me. And with that consequence removed, all gang turf becomes virtually no different than any other area, save for a few exclusive zones reserved only for the highest ranks. That's a shame. Truth be told, I think major quest choices should have tanked your reputation even further. This would lead to more dynamic gameplay moments in the open world, like the kill squads being sent after you. I never experienced that because I never pissed off a faction. I got the Imperials, who I interacted with far less, to send death squads after me, making them feel even more impactful than the actual crime syndicates. So that was a letdown. If you're going to include a reputation system, there needs to be more ways to put the player on the negative side of it. And while Outlaws does include many ways to do that, they don't impact that negative rating enough. I would have also liked to see more dynamic events in the open world that showed these factions going against one another. Like, how cool would it be to see a big section of Pike territory be taken over by Crimson Dawn on Tashara? There needed to be a bit more divergency to really make this system shine. But overall, it's the way these gangs had a presence on each planet that impressed me when it came to the world building. I wish each of them had some fleshed out characters associated with them, but as a collective, they contribute to the gameplay experience in terms of choice and consequence, especially when it comes to side content. I think this represents a good foundation for the reputation system, which could be built further on in sequels to make it something truly special. For now, it's good or decent with potential for greatness. So the open world is beautifully crafted and augmented with a reputation system that has some bite. But what all can you do in the game? That's where quests and other optional content comes in, and there's a lot of it. Main quests, syndicate quests, intel, contracts, and mini games. Main quests are pretty good with a handful of great ones that stood out amongst the rest. They can be broken up into three different acts. The first act features the tutorial and sees Kay really start to take on the outlaw lifestyle on a bigger scale, taking on a powerful crime family, failing at a heist, and crash landing on a new planet. It's during this opening third of the game where much of the game's structure and mechanics are established before really opening up an act two. You're asked to assemble a crew for a big job and this portion of the game is about finding those members. And finally, the game ropes things back in during the third act as you wrap up the main story with a few twists and turns along the way. More on that later. 
For the most part, many of these story quests provide ample enjoyment. Getting a bit spoilery here now, the rest of the video will have spoilers, so beware of that. But the foray into Java's palace to rescue Nyx, infiltrating an Imperial Star Destroyer, deciding the fate of the Ashiga clan, and aiding the rebels in destroying a powerful new weapon for the Empire were all highlights of the game. The rest of the missions were serviceable, featuring many similar combat, platforming, and stealth sections, but the ones I just mentioned, those are real highlights. If you just mainline the story quest, you'll get about 12 to 15 hours out of the experience, which isn't a lot for an open world game, but there's far more hours to be piled on with side content. To be fair though, I don't think many players will be inclined to fully complete this game 100%, as much of the side content is an avenue to experience more of the game's core mechanics until you've had your fill, because it can be repetitive. That is to say, there isn't much of note story-wise when it comes to side content. Gameplay is king here, and as long as you're enjoying it, the game is happy to deliver plenty of things to do. After establishing the main story in the opening hours, my question was, would the side content allow the player to live the outlaw lifestyle? And my answer to that is a yes, with the caveat that you are more of a smuggler than you are a bounty hunter. K Vess's personality doesn't lend credence to the latter's lifestyle, but are you a bit of a scoundrel? Sure, even if your character isn't that tough. So let's see how the side content builds on that. The most story-centric side content, and I use that adjective lightly, would be syndicate quests. These are missions where one faction will send you on an errand like collecting supplies. They often involve some traversal, a bit of stealth, maybe combat, and an offer from another faction to double-cross the quest giver. These choices often have the greatest impact on the reputation meter, so they do carry weight, although the inevitability of the choice becomes apparent after doing just a few. Still, they do attempt to interject a little more personality and flavor into the syndicates, and so I can't complain too much. Compared to side quests in other games, they feel pretty flat, but they do their job in promoting the reputation system and delivering more gameplay. At the same time, if you're working as a freelancer, taking on high-risk jobs does help to promote the outlaw role-playing. But what really enhances that experience would be the intel content. These are not story-structured side quests, but instead more player-driven experiences including things like treasure hunts and robbing vaults, and rewards the player with materials, weapon parts, speeder parts, or new outfits. What makes many of them interesting is that they are stumbled upon by the player as they naturally explore some of the towns and cities. There isn't a marked quest giver telling you where to go, but instead you happen upon rumors and hints by eavesdropping on NPCs, talking to the locals, or reading a data pad. They happen naturally as you play and then it's added to your quest log and you can choose to pursue it or not. If one interests you, then do it but outside of some tutorial ones early on in Tashara, you aren't really forced to, which is nice. Often the rewards lead to a tangible upgrade, and there's something so cool about overhearing some criminals talk about where they buried their loot, and then traveling there and picking it up before they can. That's just a great feeling. Most of these mini quests are rather short, but there is one called Jet Cordo's Legacy, which does prove to be quite lengthy, it is a bit repetitive, but there is that too. Now, next up we have a specific type of intel called Expert Intel. By far, this is one of the game's most interesting inclusions and is unlike anything I've really ever played before. Across the game, Kay can find eight different NPCs who are masters in their line of work. By doing a job for them, the player can get a few different rewards like Sabak cheats, a turret for their spaceship, the ability to handle heavy weapons, and more. These are great abilities, but what fascinated me is that those ability trees are tied directly to the experts. Completing a quest for one of these experts unlocks one skill on that ability tree, for free. But it also grants access to five more abilities that you must unlock. And the cool thing is, 
There is no experience bar that rolls over and gives you a skill point arbitrarily. No, the game tasks you with doing different things to unlock the ability. This includes things like landing a certain number of headshots, or collecting a certain number of resources, or using nicks to gather objects. They're little gameplay things that you must do. It's not about an experience bar, it's just about experience. I really enjoyed this refreshing approach to skill trees, as it felt like when I unlocked a new skill, it was because I earned it, not simply by playing the game and being handed points, and that was cool. I think it goes a long way in supporting the role-playing experience as well. But then, we have contracts. These are minor missions that you can complete for different syndicates to raise your reputation. They aren't nearly as involved as syndicate quests and feel a lot like filler. Often they will take you to areas you've already been while completing the main story missions, and see you doing menial tasks like collecting data or delivering some parts. Nothing fascinating at all, and they seem to be here simply to give the player a way to max every syndicate's reputation meter without hurting another. And finally, there's a series of mini-games, none more amazing than Sabacc. I mean, they found a way to get poker into my Star Wars game, how could I not love it? I really haven't felt this great about gambling in a video game since playing Blackjack in Red Dead Redemption 2. What can I say, part of me loves to gamble, and this was right up my alley. Sabacc is like poker if every winning hand was a pair. Lower pairs are the best thing you can have, but a handful of abilities called shift tokens keep the matches interesting and lend a little bit of strategy. And as a true scoundrel, you can even cheat, but don't get caught or you might get kicked out. Nothing says degenerate outlaw more like losing all your credits at the Sabacc table, a pathetic feat I almost accomplished early on in my playthrough. Besides this though, there's a few other things to do like speeder races, horse betting, or playing old arcade games. But Sabak, Yeah, move over Queen's Blood, it's my new favorite minigame this year. So when it comes to content, we have a mixed bag. Some great story missions, syndicate and expert intel missions that affect the status of the world and skill trees, but aren't necessarily interesting or unique mechanically or narratively, a bunch of repetitive contracts, and intel that provides short and sweet content that rewards handsomely. Sabak is the cherry on top, and overall, as a package, I think it's good. Not great, but good. There's a lot to do if this game has its hooks in you. Of course, it doesn't matter how much content there is. If the core gameplay loop isn't fun, then you won't want to play it. To be honest with you, Star Wars Outlaws was one of the most pure fun experiences I've had in gaming this year, and no, I'm not kidding. The second to second loop is familiar, but what can I say, it really works. Boosting around on your speeder, launching off of ramps, arriving at your destination, only to uncover some awesome Star Wars location, rich in atmosphere, or even better, a dungeon where you'll be doing a bit of stealth or run and gun combat. That is the loop. Go somewhere, climb something, stealth for a bit, and then let your blasters reign supreme. It's simple, but let's break it down into three major categories and look at them in more detail. Level design, stealth, and combat. Regardless of what content you're doing, you'll often be asked to move into a guarded territory and find your way to an item or a passageway using stealth, combat, or a combination of both. In terms of level design, I found many of them to be relatively well made, especially the compounds found in the open worlds. Oftentimes, there will be multiple ways to enter a facility, whether it's through the front gate or a series of openings on the outskirts. I wish this extended to the areas found within some of the more scripted main missions, which often feel like you're being railroaded through a set piece. It's not bad, but the freedom to approach a level from multiple routes is always appreciated. From there, you'll find some common but effective principles of designing stealth areas, such as vents to climb through plenty of cover to crouch next to, and deployable smoke bombs to temporarily cloak yourself in. Stringing together smart movement through using these mitigates the enemy's advantage, both in the number of soldiers and in their use of technology. You'll often find cameras monitoring hallways, guards patrolling by you, or locked doors that need to be picked to gain access. By the way, this game has two different lockpicking minigames, 
one is akin to Wordle, and another is a quick test of rhythm, and I love both. Very quietly the best lockpicking I've ever seen in video games, and they nailed it with two different systems. Most games can't even get one right. So between the multiple ways to approach a compound, and the balance struck between obstacles and helpful objects, I'd say the level design is quite strong. In fact, it might even lift up the stealth and combat, which are admittedly simple, but a ton of fun. Moving on to stealth, and let me begin by saying that this game does not force you to stealth nearly as much as you might think after watching early reviews. Yes, the team did patch the stealth by making you harder to spot and including a few more favorable checkpoints, but at no point did I feel like the stealth was ruining my experience. For me, I felt like the stealth was fair. When I'm on a syndicate's turf and I get caught and auto fail, it makes sense, and I don't begrudge the game for that. Outside of those moments, the game will often give you time to react and save yourself. Many missions feature the objective of, quote, don't set off the alarm, end quote. And you can of course do this through pure stealth, but if you do get caught, you'll often have time to react by taking out all the enemies in combat before one of them is able to trigger the alarm that forces the restart. This led to some really fun and frantic gameplay moments where I'd be doing my best to silently knock out a few guards and remain in the shadows before making a mistake, getting caught, and whipping out my blaster to shred anyone who got close to the alarm. So to me, in my mind, any concerns about forced stealth should be disregarded if that's your main concern. It's fine, especially after the patch. Now, there were also claims that stealth was just really basic, and on that front, I can't help but to agree. You have your run-of-the-mill tools when stealthing through a section, hiding behind objects, although this is done freely through movement, not snap to cover. There's also smoke bombs, binoculars to scope an area out, a whistle to lure guards, a roll to get through areas faster, your overpowered one-hit KO stealth takedowns, which do have a really slow animation, and more. If this simple toolset sounds familiar to you, it very much is. For me, it was a case of, if it's not broke, don't fix it. These are tried and true stealth mechanics that I can't imagine ever not being in a stealth game. But if you want your stealth experience to go further than that, it probably won't, save for one fascinating new inclusion, one that I really enjoyed. Maybe other games have done this before, but your companion Nyx, who is quite adorable by the way, acts as a really awesome extension of K, especially in stealth. Nyx is capable of flipping switches, opening doors, fetching items, pickpocketing guards, and distracting and attacking nearby enemies. By holding down the L1 button, many of these actions become immediately accessible with very intuitive and easy to use controls. Whatever you need Nyx to do, he's capable of getting the job done within a few snappy button prompts, which is important in a stealth game where one slip up is the difference between being caught or not. One of my favorite things to do in this game was to encounter two enemies talking to each other and having Nyx attack one. In the mayhem, I'd run up and knock the other one out while Nyx continued chewing the other one's face off, and then I'd turn my attention to that other guard and take him out too. It was ultra satisfying, and Nyx proved to be a handy tool time and time again. There was even a mission where you briefly lose him, and I felt his loss more because he was absent from the narrative, but also from my toolbox. I don't think he's getting enough credit for how much he brings to stealth and combat in Star Wars Outlaws. It's nothing revolutionary, but having a tool as flexible and powerful as him added immeasurable joy to my playthrough. So yes, stealth is basic, but it is serviceable. But what really made me enjoy Star Wars Outlaws far more than I expected to was the combat. It too remains quite simple, as Kay only has a blaster, Nyx, and her fist to use by default. It's a small toolbox, but it can be expanded by picking up grenades or enemy drops. It sucks that you drop those enemy guns by performing other actions, but because of their low ammo count, I almost always depleted the clip before doing anything else. 
And I really think that sums up why I found this combat system to be so fun, despite the simplicity of it. The run and gun nature of it. There were times where I would forego stealth altogether and immediately start blasting like Danny DeVito. I'd send Nyx to attack an enemy while shooting at another before running over and grabbing their drop weapon and using that to blast away at some more enemies before racing up to a dude and knocking him out with a jump punch and then turning to an explosive barrel and shooting it to take out a bunch more enemies. I'm not sure if that was the intended playstyle or not, but it was mine and let me tell you, it was so much fun to play the game in this way, a total power rush on the normal difficulty. It was arguably too easy, and a lack of meaningful enemy variety didn't help, but I'll be damned if I wasn't having a blast. If you're finding the stealth to be a bit on the boring side, I encourage you to play it more as a third person shooter from the jump, because the game will surprisingly let you do this more often than you might expect. It sort of reminds me of that dude that played Watch Dogs all hyper aggressive, and made the title far more enjoyable as a result. While I did derive a lot of fun from this experience, even I can admit there are some flaws, or at least things that I'd like to see improved in a sequel. I already alluded to the easiness, and you can turn that up in the difficulty section of the settings, but I think another reason for that is because the enemy AI is not very bright. They are not as brain dead as you might see in some cherry picked clips online, but I will admit they aren't the smartest. They won't do a lot of advanced maneuvering like trying to flank you, they won't often take cover, and many of their shots do miss, although in the case of Stormtroopers, it's lore accurate. Regardless, one of the major reasons I was able to play so chaotically is because the enemies were not capable enough of keeping tabs on me and reacting fast enough to punish my extreme aggression. It was fun for me, but if you're trying to play it more as a cover shooter or a stealth game, it could be a little bit disappointing, and I can see where that comes from. My other real complaint is the lack of evolution in stealth and combat as the game progresses. Many of the tools you start the game with will be the exact same ones as you roll credits. You can unlock a few new abilities in the skill trees like picking up heavy weapons or fake surrendering, but they fluctuate things only in a marginal way. The layout of arenas doesn't change, not a lot of new enemy types are introduced, your weapons change incrementally, and many of the systems remain pretty stagnant. I would have liked if the game found some new ways to challenge the player as it went on, but it's really a case of what you see is what you get. To get the most out of it, you'll have to make your own fun, but luckily the game is willing to let you do that, and that's what I appreciated most, the freedom to approach many encounters how I wanted to, which was ironically, what I was led to believe doesn't happen at all. One thing that did surprise me a bit was that K's loadout can be customized and it's more than just cosmetics. Each piece of clothing comes with a few passive perks, and while none of them are groundbreaking, they do add a very small amount of choice. I found some armor pieces that suited my more chaotic playstyle and used them throughout. Most of these were either about boosting up my health since I flew by the seat of my pants, but others fueled my adrenaline meter, a bar that, when filled, allows you to do some precision shooting, like in Red Dead Redemption 2. You also unlock charm slots as you continue to play, and can fill them with items found in the world. These also grant K more passive benefits. To be fair, armor and charms are pretty plug and play, nothing of depth to consider, but they are there. More interesting would be our blaster weapon, which sort of reminded me of the service weapon from Control, because it's a few guns in one. As you play, you unlock three different modes, Plasma, Ion, and Power, and each of these three modes has two or three different variations that affects things like power and rate of fire. For example, the Plasma mode has a standard shot, a rapid fire mode that reminded me of a machine gun, and a heavy mode that shoots a slow but powerful shot. You can swap between each ammo type as well as their modes on the fly, which made combat a blast. Like, some enemies demand that you hit them with an Ion Blast to take down a shield before you damage them with Plasma. And I love the Power Mode that shot off a Charge Blast that did heavy damage. It's nothing too crazy, but it did offer a variety of different playstyles in one, which was cool. 
And before moving on, I did want to briefly mention space combat because while it isn't something you'll do a ton of, it'll still be thrust upon you a few times throughout the main story, and especially if you engage with side content. It too is quite simple, but it does provide a great atmosphere. A generous lock-on system and the ability to stop on a dime makes it incredibly easy to get through any fight unscathed, but they do feel distinctly Star Wars in nature. It didn't challenge me much mechanically, but the spectacle of it was enough. Hell, it's better than what I experienced in Starfield, that's for sure, and if you go out of your way to collect materials, you can upgrade your ship and speeder to make them even better. Shifting focus to the story here, and I think this is where the game drops the ball the most. Going into the experience, I was excited for a Star Wars story that didn't get caught up in Jedi, Sith, lightsabers, clones, the Force, droids, stormtroopers, and rebels. Throughout the original movies, we got snippets into the shady businesses and gangs comprising the crime underbelly of this universe, but never much in the way of a thorough examination. This game had a chance to explore that environment and its darker and grittier themes far more than any movie or show has. Unfortunately, despite a decent setup for a heist-style story, the game couldn't help but to heed the siren's call, returning to the Star Wars tropes and themes we've seen countless times before. So, let's break it down, and yes, again, there will be major story spoilers, so skip this section if that bothers you. K Vess is our protagonist here, a down-on-her-luck outlaw who's been waiting for a big break, a chance to earn a ton of credits and retire somewhere nice, like Naboo perhaps. She just needs that one job that will put her in that spot, and it's something she's always chasing. It seems like that time has come for her in the opening hours when she's contracted to help rip off a billionaire named Slero in a classic Rob the Vault heist. Things don't go as planned, of course, and Kay is forced to flee her home planet and find new ways to make money. During the next few hours, many of the story missions are focused on Kay getting her footing and attempting to repair her ship, and it does certainly feel like this time on Tashara is a lull in the action. The game uses this time to really establish the open world and different quest types, as well as other basics of the game, but narratively, it doesn't feel like much is happening. Kay isn't really meeting anyone interesting personality-wise, but instead just people that run the crime syndicates on the planet. Eventually though, you reach a point where Kay's ship is fully fixed, and she's ready to take off in search of another big gig in the massive galaxy. Before she can get off world though, she is saved by a droid named ND5 who is owned by a man named Jalen Frax, another outlaw who recruits Kay to rob a vault, the same one she failed to rob in the tutorial. And this kicks off the second act, which is by far the game's strongest portion narratively speaking. Kay is tasked with assembling a crew capable of getting into the vault, and she plays a pivotal role in that team herself, as she's the only one who's had first-hand experience with the target. ND5 is assigned to follow you and is given instructions to blast you if you try to do anything that goes against Jalen's plan. But Kay is more than willing to go along with it, as it seems to be the chance she's always dreamed of, to pull off the big score. From here, you're tasked with traveling to three different planets and recruiting a team member from each, and like I said, this is the best part of the game. Without many strong characters or big personalities, the best way to get the player's interest narratively was to create a series of vignettes, small stories that nail the Star Wars atmosphere. And they did just that. This includes settling a turf war on Kajimi amongst the Ashiga and Crimson Dawn, working alongside a bounty hunter on Tatooine to escape Jabba the Hutt's clutches, and helping an old friend escape his life within the Empire, and aiding a few rebels along the way. The recruits themselves are forgettable, but these are all cool moments because they tap into the Star Wars mythos without devolving too far into them. Yes, there's rebels, stormtroopers, and more, but during this section, it felt like Kay was wholly separated from those entities, seeing both sides as problems, even the rebels, the ones we've always associated as being good. Of course, that neutral perspective is eventually lost when entering the game's final section where you make your move against Slero and his vault. After doing so well to keep those heavily treaded ideas at arm's length during the middle portion of the game, things devolve back into the de facto Star Wars story of Empire vs. Rebels in the finale. 
Slero is revealed to be working with the Imperials the whole time, and his crime syndicate, Zarek Besh, is mostly just a cover-up for the work he does for the Empire. I let out a huge sigh during this reveal, especially when Darth Vader shows up for a cameo. That appearance feels really played out by this point, after seeing it across many movies and games. Like, this probably should have been the Emperor, that would have at least felt a little refreshing, if not cheesy, but Darth? Yeah, I love the guy, but we've seen him so many times now. Anyway, Kay and the crew eventually succeed in robbing Slero's vault, but one more surprise awaits for them. Jalen reveals that the real object the team was stealing is Slero's information, and he plans on using that as leverage on the Empire to make him the leader of Zarek Besh in exchange for that data. And then there's this whole subplot where you've built up this connection with ND5 during the story, and then when Jalen betrays you, the droid has to choose between Kay and his owner, and it just felt really cheesy. I mean, ND5 is commanded to incapacitate you, and he does, but he says, oh, I really didn't want to do this. And the whole thing leaves Kay feeling like the droid is better off with her and the crew versus Jalen. So she hatches a plan to free ND5 from his control, and that of course becomes the final mission. So we do just that, and of course end up helping the rebels in a major way by blowing up a Star Destroyer, and woohoo, here we are, right back in Empires vs. Rebels, in a game about crime syndicates in the Star Wars universe. It feels like a heavily discounted version of A New Hope. Worse characters, worse motivations, and not nearly enough build-up to leave any sort of impact narratively. About as generic as you can get. I don't think at any point I ever cared about any of the characters in this story, except for the time that Nyx got kidnapped. None of them were compelling or interesting in unique ways, and many of their contributions to the story or overall motivations just seemed odd. Like, throughout the game we get the whole backstory about how Kay's mother abandoned her and how she's been on her own, and then later that mother joins the crew and it feels so underwhelming. There's supposed to be this moment where Rico shows how she does care for her daughter, but it comes off as completely flat. It seems like they threw this plot thread in now so that the season pass might be able to touch on it with future content, but her inclusion in the main story was just so hollow and underdeveloped. And then there's the whole ND5 situation where, you know, he's this droid, he's supposed to be under control of someone else, but then he also has a personality of his own, despite being a droid, and I don't really know what they were going for. It's like they wanted to touch on that whole idea of what defines humanity, and can an inanimate object actually act like a human? But they didn't present it in a way that gives you pause for thought. ND5 has commands that he must obey, and the fact that he hesitates at one point to obey Jalen just comes off as odd. I don't really get where his personality is coming from, and how it's able to clash so much with what he's commanded to do. The writing didn't give me any reason to think that ND5 was capable of disobeying a direct order, outside of the mythical power of friendship, and the whole thing just felt off. So you have two muddled plot points here with ND5 and Rico that just didn't feel right, like you threw them in, but even that wasn't enough because then they have the plot twist where Jalen is actually Slero's brother and Slero's working for the Empire all at the same time. It's like they came up with ideas in the writing room and instead of eliminating one and focusing on making one really good, they just said throw them all in and it kind of sucks. It fails to carry weight because we're never given a reason to care about any of these characters and we're just getting plot points thrown at us over and over again. Overall, the story of Star Wars Outlaws was the weakest element of the package. It had a good middle portion, but everything else just fell flat. They failed to build up the characters, they utilized meaningless plot twists, they jammed in a cameo that's been done far too many times, and they failed to give us any reason to get invested. Kay is not that interesting, nor are any of the people she meets along the way. And if you don't care about the characters, you probably won't care about the story. A cheesy heist plot with way too many plot points just isn't able to maintain interest. And finally, let's wrap things up with a few notes on the presentation. And let me say, 
this game has a lot of good detail work. Out of all the graphical elements, the detail work is what stood out to me the most. I noticed it most in the environmental design, whether I was out in the open world or in the city streets. There's also a handful of those awesome scenic moments where you get to see everything in one stunning shot. Everything just has that handcrafted feel, like you can tell the developers took the extra time to get it right while also interjecting a healthy amount of Star Wars iconography and atmosphere into the experience. It really is something special, and I think it does even outdo Jedi Survivor on this front. This excellence in design unfortunately makes the bad elements seem really bad, in particular K Vess's character model. I don't really understand what happened here, but she often looks so much worse than everything else in the frame, especially in cutscenes where she's featured. The terrible lip syncing also didn't help. I don't know why it couldn't be cleaned up a little bit more to deliver a more consistently good package. Unfortunately, this weakness also extends to the voice acting, which I felt was lacking throughout. I felt like a lot of the performances had no heart and soul to them, especially that of the main protagonist. I mean, sometimes a standout voice performance can be enough to elevate less than stellar character building or writing, but Outlaws is never afforded that luxury because the voice acting often feels average or below average. The music, on the other hand, definitely helps building up the already strong Star Wars atmosphere. It was pretty good. And that leaves sound effects to split the tie between good and bad. And you know what? That was a mixed bag too. Mostly good sound effects that added a lot to combat, but the punching sound effect lacked a convincing oomph. Overall, when it comes to audio, a mixture of strong and weak elements. Despite the missteps, I mostly view this game's presentation and performance in a positive light. I mean, I didn't really notice many frame rate drops or texture pop in or anything like that, and the only bug I had was this one, where Kay got stuck on a ladder after punching an enemy while standing too close to it. Outside of that, no issues, and that's good. Ultimately, I think what leaves the presentation feeling favorable to me was the strong sense of atmosphere, one of the thickest and most well-realized ones I've experienced in a game this year, and potentially ever when it comes to the Star Wars license. You know, I think a lot of the initial disdain for this game is because it's published by Ubisoft, and let's face facts, most of their games can usually be summed up by saying they are functional, decent, and sometimes good, but they're content with being just that. All right, and not much more. People get tired of their games not striving to be more, and I don't blame them. I think Star Wars Outlaws can be lumped onto that pile, but I don't think it makes this game the awful experience that many would lead you to believe. If playing through another Ubisoft title doesn't really appeal to you, then yeah, no need to purchase this game. You won't get much out of it. Although, I do personally feel like it tries a little bit harder than the average title from that publisher. And that's on the developers, Massive Entertainment, for attempting to go further with some novel ideas. Star Wars Outlaws has a lot of systems, but none of those systems are super deep. If you're looking for complexity in design, you really won't find it here. But this is an open world action adventure game, and on that front, I think it succeeds. The atmosphere is probably the best representation of Star Wars I've ever seen in a video game. The stealth and combat are familiar, but they are serviceable, and when you're given the freedom to play more aggressively, it's a lot of fun. It succeeds in providing a power rush while stealth remains serviceable. And then you have Nyx, he's a great extension tool that I will miss in other games with stealth moving forward. And along with this novel idea, I like the syndicate and reputation systems as a starting point to be built on in a potential sequel, and I thought the way abilities were handled was also new and exciting. All in all, some good ideas here, not quite taken as far as I would have liked, making them a little bit shallow at times, but still good. Of course, the game does have its flaws, like a lack of enemy variety and weakness in AI, a story that starts interesting but couldn't help but to default back to Star Wars status quo, and a feeling of stagnation that can persist throughout the game as it fails to evolve any of its systems and mechanics as it progresses. Personally, these problems didn't stop the game from being an enjoyable experience, and while there's other games that I'd be faster to recommend for sure, that doesn't mean that Star Wars Outlaws is a disaster. 
We live in a world where everything has to be either a 1 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10 because the extremeness in opinions is what attracts attention and clicks. But I don't buy into that ideology. The reality is, not every new game is going to be elite, and if you're looking for something that's a fun time and satisfies your nostalgia for old Star Wars, then this game is going to hook you up. Truth be told, if this game had come out in June or July, when there wasn't much else going on, I think it would have fared much better. The late release in August was brutal with so many great games on the near horizon. Anyway, yeah, I like this game. It's a solid starting point, and I hope it sells well enough that a sequel is considered. It's not looking that way, but I do think this is a good foundation that can certainly be built upon. I can see how some folks wouldn't like Outlaws, and I'm not saying you have to, but if you're more of a casual gamer like myself, I think there's some joy to be had here, so consider giving it a shot. Thanks for watching. Alright guys, that wraps up this review of Star Wars Outlaws. I'd love to hear your opinions about the game in the comments below, whether you enjoyed it or hated it. Thank you so much for watching. Please leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Consider subscribing for more. Follow me on Twitter at NopeNapNarp. And as always guys, have a nice day and take care.